What is your story? Oh, you want to know my story? Uh, yes. I can give you part of it because it's a long one, but the reason why I'm out here, the reason why I'm homeless, I can do that. Uh, let's see now. It all started when I was, I met a beautiful woman. I was, had a family. I had, I changed careers from carpenter and automotive technician and I was actually going to school for it. Um, my, her, her ex-husband, he wound up killing himself in our garage. And I lost her after 10 years of being with her. She was really mentally distraught about this. And she literally opened the garage door and found his body on the floor. It was, she couldn't deal with it. So she moved away from me and moved further and further away over a period of a couple of years. I wound up moving away. Um, this is tough, my story. I wound up working for an auction company. I worked there for 10 years, very hard, hard labor, but it was fun. See a, see a new, you actually see and hear a new story almost every day. You get to go through people's houses. Some of the houses look like people were still there. A cup of coffee on the table and, and so on. It's a very strange feeling. Liquidation? It, it, most of the time it would, had been when a, a judge or an attorney called us when someone died. And you have to liquidate the property, including the house. So we would go in, we'd contact families, ask them to come, and if they couldn't come, then we'd describe what we had in the house and if they wanted anything. A certain picture, a box of jewelry, you know, what have you. And it, like I said, it was hard work carrying furniture and stuff, but it was fun. It was different. After 15 years, I had a heart attack on the job. So we were carrying a couch down the steps, and I told my coworker to stop in the middle of the steps, and I dropped the couch, and luckily I didn't hurt him in the process. And I managed to make it outside to the truck, and I said, I need to go to the hospital. So my boss was all upset and mad. I'm dying, and he's unhappy that I have to go to the hospital. He's a real piece of work. Anyway, got an ambulance ride to the hospital, and you had a heart attack. Really? Because um, I honestly didn't know what the hell was going on. I, my arm went numb. No pain. It was just went numb. I couldn't pick up anything at all. Left arm? The wrong arm. Or, the right arm. Hmm. That's what the doctor said. Hmm. Uh, so the, I said, isn't the left arm the one that's supposed to be affected? And he, they said, not always, but normally. So I had a stroke at the same time. The neurologist came to the hospital. The cardiologist came to the hospital. I was in. I was admitted for, for five days. Very intensive care those five days. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, my boss came to visit me in the hospital like the second day I was there. And he's like, you know, can you come back to work? And I'm like, excuse me, I'm not even thinking about that right now. I'm thinking about staying alive. I was conscious, but I was all feeling all this weird, new, strange pains. And I, it's hard to describe when you can go your whole life and never feel your heart beating. But I actually could feel it with the pain. So every boom, boom was a ow, 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 ow. It's a very strange feeling. And he's asking me if I can come back to work. The kicker is that I was also renting an apartment from him on his property. Mm. And he said, well, you know, since you can't work for me anymore and you don't know when you'll be able to come back, I'm going to have to fill your position. 
He didn't say it, but I was fired. I was let go. After 15 years, that really didn't make me happy. He, he didn't give me any time to find a place to live. I, he gave me 30 days. I was in the hospital yeah. uh, the day after Christmas. And I was homeless five days later. The hospital paid for a, a ride, a taxi ride, to the Beacon House. So I didn't know what the Beacon House was. So I lost my apartment, I lost my job, I lost everything. Um, I was by myself, I was alone. I spent a lot of years with a beautiful woman and family that I loved. Uh, so, you know, broken hearted, getting older. Great, have a heart attack. My brother died, ironically, in age 52. Ask me how old I am. How old are you? I'm 52. This happened almost three years, two and three quarter years ago. And my brother had just happened to die at age 52. He walked out of the door to go to work and he was with his girlfriend and he said, I don't feel good. Bang. He was dead before he hit the floor. Was it also like it was? It was also a heart attack. It was a massive heart attack. Um, the doctors, they all asked me about family history, about medical history. Did, did you run in your family? And I'm like, no, because no, no one I know of had a heart attack. My grandparents, great grandparents, they've all lived old age. Um, my brother, when he was born, Danny. When he was born, he had four holes in his heart. And they immediately had to perform open heart surgery on a less than an infant when you're first, very first born. <clears throat> so they patched the heart, holes in his heart. <clears throat> and he was fine. He was fine all his life. He could run, jump, dance, lift weights. He could do anything. He never had a heart issue. So that, doc, that question to me, if I've ever had that in my family about a heart attack, I'm like, no, but I've told him, I told him about my brother. It was more of a birth defect than, than something that you would relate to a heart attack, like that runs in the family. I don't know how to explain it, but anyway, I had a heart attack. I lost my job after a very long time. I lost my place to live at the same time. Uh, all I did was work. I didn't have any friends to speak of, which is, anyway, I don't want to get emotional again, but I lost everything. I know how cruel this society can be. I heard a number of stories like this. someone has cancer in their fires, especially with manual labor, someone has chemotherapy, how can they? work manual labor. So, I, yeah, it's... Uh, it's I, I had flying and it's useful that you were say, telling it because people need to know that this is something that's not very right with this society, that someone can fall ill and, and lose everything. I, I didn't know, but I, <laughs> I found out when I was dropped off at the Beacon House and I asked the driver, I had one backpack with me, that was it. That's what I owned. And I asked, I said, what do I do now? I'm not, I was a productive member of society before. And I'm, I'm, I like throwing this in because a lot of people think that everyone who's homeless is like a convict. And I'm not on parole or probation or I have any restrictions. I'm free men and I had a life, I had a job. <coughs> I had everything. I had everything my heart desired because I earned it and I lost everything. And I wound up homeless. That term, I never thought about it the way I think about it now. Never could, I never could think about it and, and put a, a definition to it. Because I wasn't, you have to be homeless to realize. Quit your job, move out of your house, and throw everything you have away 
and go knock on the shelter door. I can't imagine, especially the people at the shelter get about three hours of sleep at night. How can yeah. some? I wouldn't be able to arrange my life if I if I only was allowed to sleep for three hours at night. Honestly, it's. Maybe, I don't know how I'm alive right now. Do you catch up here? No, I'd never sleep here. I've never slept here. I sit at the desk, you probably, you don't see me as much as I'm I actually see, here, but. I see you at the desk, and why not take a nap? Because I, I just, I want to be alert. I want to actually, you know, when the uh, former employer, employee, I'm sorry, was here, I would like to be able to help if there was a situation, when, and when, there's always someone causing trouble somewhere. I'm sorry, but that's just a fact of life, and yeah, that's yeah. part of the center it's part of, and it's, and yeah, and so I always like to help, so I want to be there for you know, just like today i'm what's on my mind during this interview is is everybody okay downstairs? you know I'm protective of this place. I've been here a long time um, after after becoming homeless, I've gone one doctor's appointment to another and that's what I do it's how I've been living with with on our own's help having a place to come during the day and watch a video or go through my paperwork which I've got too much of just ponder what what I'm doing then go to the next doctor's appointment that's what I do I had one yesterday I'm going to one today I mean tomorrow um, I, I have doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment because I, understand. I have serious medical issues and I'm trying to stay alive. I don't want to, I don't want to do what the doctors told me that I, you know, you're not going to make it. Doctors are, yeah, sometimes they say that. It's well, I, I, very you know, it's hard not to take a, a a doctor's word for something when the, he was the one who actually saved your life. Dr. Levanji saved my life. I would have... I, I don't care what anyone says. He saved my life because he went above and beyond his... Even, even to go and consult with serious professionals about me and who am I. I'm just nobody. And he saved my life. I, I was cardioversioned, it's the proper term, I call it electrocuted, nine different times to bring my heart back after over the, a period of four months after the heart attack. So my heart was in AFib. I couldn't, I couldn't walk 10 feet without just being completely exhausted. My heart wasn't pumping. Only half of my heart was working. And... He brought me back to life. My heart is fully functional. It's damaged. It's beyond like repair. So I have enlarged ventricle and things like that. And then I woke up. Yep. And uh, <laughs> so that's what I, I'm doing. I'm living on the street, going to doctor's appointments, trying to stay alive. And it hurts. Yes. So I'm sorry I got emotional, but this is. And I'm glad that this is being recorded. Well, I'm hoping people need to know. I don't. This. I don't know that anybody could imagine. I, I, the doctors and the nurses when I was in the hospital for five days, they were beautiful. They were, to me, it was incredible how much they cared about about me, and they proved it and they showed it and they did it, and talked to me and cared for me and I was wasn't ready to go physically because I couldn't walk and uh, I just never could imagine I don't think anyone could imagine what it's like until you people it's like society just kicked you out and left you so it's a lot of fun I recommend it I'm kidding, of course. Yes, we live in a society where successful people that make decisions don't realize that one slip and they can be here themselves very often. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe how easy it was. 
I had I, I, know I woke up homeless and I had no one to call. Usually, like you know, as young as young folks, I call a friend. Come on over, man. Sleep in my basement, you know. As you get older and all you find yourself, all you're doing is working, which I mean, most middle class people do. That's what I did. I worked, paid bills. Yes. And all, on over a period of time, I, I can't imagine. It was unbelievable, I guess, how much I lost touch with friends and my family members. Or I have one left out of eight, and uh, he lives in Arkansas, and all he does is work. I'm happy to have him. He's a uh, guy I talk to every once in a while when I could talk alone. Uh, being able to make a phone call in private is super hard. Here. No, it's super hard. I go outside, someone comes outside and starts talking. I go out front, someone comes out front, starts talking. You can't hide in the bathroom and there is an echo. And I go out in the street and there's traffic going by. And I'm like, Kevin, I gotta, I gotta call you back. I can't talk right now. It's, I'm sorry. I love you, but hang up the phone. and. Yes. It, it, it's really, it's, it's super difficult to make a private phone call. I, I swear to you, I, you can't in the shelter. You've got to turn your cell phone in. That's a little <coughs> ridiculous. When, when you walk in the door, you turn your stuff in. Considering that cell phones are the modern way to, if someone does something dishonest or some organization or some place doesn't run very well, the, f the phone is the best way to document it. It's a, I didn't know that. Yeah, it is. It's you, as soon as you walk in the door, it, when you're searched, like an animal. I understand safety precautions. Someone bringing in a gun or a knife, but you're searched, and any medication you have, even if you're taking medication that night, you have to turn in, turn in your cell phone, and the electronics. If they knew what this did, I'd have to turn it in. So I could listen to music on it. It's illegal. So I put my Bluetooth headphones on and I go like this. And I listen to music because it's the only way I can have a little bit of sanity. And you're right about the three hours of sleep. I don't think anybody gets three hours of sleep in there. It's, it's probably more like two. Now the rest, that's a different story. Probably 11 o'clock through till the morning, five o'clock. There's Sometimes it's quiet. You get rest, but you're sleeping on a mattress that's this big, which is hard as a rock. Sleeping on a steel bunk, if you're lucky. A lot of people are sleeping on the floor. A lot of people don't have mats. They have uh, someone donated like 50 or 60 sleep rolls with sleeping bags, and they're on the hard floor with no cushion. And it's, I don't know how they get any sleep. A lot of people in there doing drugs. A lot of people. I believe that. I I have my medications. Just, just making sure yeah, I'm running out of time. Yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt I'm so abruptly. I'm just. Mm. But I mean, it's just as far as the, the homeless living conditions. I know you're gonna edit. As far as the living conditions, it. I don't know. I don't know the last time I I got a night's sleep without having to purchase. And this part, I'm not ashamed. I'm not afraid to tell. I tell my doctors, I have to purchase medication, sleep medication, because I have insomnia and I have sleep apnea. I use a sleep a CPAP machine. I toss and turn all night. I wear a mask. It's very hard to breathe and. I have to purchase sleep medication because doctors will not give medication out through, even through your insurance company that paid for. They won't. And I don't want narcotics, addictive narcotics. There are other sleep medicines that they can give, but they don't prescribe them. Even to someone like me who never had a history of drug abuse. Or, I'm aware. And, my, I have family who's dependent on sleeping medicine. What does peer support mean to you? It means everything right now. It's all I've got. It really is. Um, if I didn't have these people to talk to, 
I throw myself in front of a bus because I, w along with Say this that. whole sit and I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding at all. I've thought about it. Um, my doctor asked me yesterday, he said, are you depressed? At some point, I'm like, I what do you think? There's nothing. I've, I'm, I have nothing. I'm homeless. I, I, I do have a roof over my head at the shelter and here, but uh, I want my family back. That's what it comes down to. Is I want my family back. I have. I had some. <sighs> I had the similar. Uh, I had thoughts about suicide in the past. I had. So thoughts about suicide and then I watched a documentary where it was a, a documentary about some isolated tribe, isolated culture in Siberia and they interviewed a shaman who explained their position on suicide for whatever reason. I already forgot the, what the documentary was about uh, and the position on suicide that they had is that if someone kills themselves they're pretty much reborn in the same state in the same they, state. They don't advance in the spiritual? No, they just, they're just born into a new life uh, with the same amount of trauma and suffering as the, the one that they, they left. So, for some reason, that idea stuck with me. Well, to me, that's a good way of preventing suicide. I think it is and a good another, way. Of another threat from the gods. Yes. Hello, Chuck, how are you? Okay. Sorry, Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, we'll skip some questions. Uh, what would you like to happen for the culture in the center to become more peer-run? Uh, I've been working on that a little bit myself since I've been employed here. Uh, the, the, the drugs are running rampant in, out, out there. It is crazy how bad the spice is and PCP and everything else. It is amazing to me how the people who are homeless that I interact with regularly, not by choice, have access to this. And I think what I can do for on our own and, and for my peers is to try to help eliminate that here anyway. We're already taking some measures, simple things like keeping the gate locked and and being more uh, diligent. And it, uh, I hate doing this job because it's hard for me to remove someone from here, and I'm, I really don't want to. Uh, someone's passed out drooling on the couch, you know, and they're unconscious from spice. They have to go. Uh, so, to, just quick to answer your question, is I'd like to help remove the, the drugs from here. The people that do the drugs, that don't want help, that don't care about a peer-run organization. They may if they weren't. Yes, but it's, it's impossible to remove someone remove the drug without the removing the person that right? would be that would be super if if i could tell everybody that came in here who smoked that stuff said uh y'all have to go please come back tomorrow when you're straight and utilize some of the things we have to offer i would it's a little harder than that though i don't want to say this on camera but i will I had to have a person removed today by the police. And it hurts me because the guy is a good guy. He didn't want to listen to me. He was so spiced up that he couldn't help being unconscious and I had to remove him. That element doesn't belong here. And even though he's a nice guy, he's under the influence really bad of, of this drug. That's part of the job I hate. Part of the job I love is when, when we talk, when I talk to someone who, who wants to listen, someone talks to me and I want to listen. That's what I love about this because it does make me feel like a human being again. When I leave here, 
I don't feel like a human being. I don't. I feel like just a piece of something garbage that was thrown out. People look at you. Yeah, he's homeless. It's just about anybody with a backpack walking around is homeless. And people give you looks and I, I know. You know what they're thinking. I know what they're thinking. And I just wish, as far as the, the culture we live in, which I'm sorry to say is not going to change anytime soon. I wish it would change. I think it will exhaust itself and change at some point. I, I hope so. I do notice the, the tendency that someone can all of a sudden lose everything and then they will be kicked around like a soccer ball between this is the end of my liability, go somewhere else. Yeah, it, this, you, can't, you can't hang out here. Right. But no where, where you we don't can. want you here. Because all those people that do spice out there, they're also kicked around like soccer balls, and there's no, <coughs> there's no safe injection or safe spice smoking place. There's no way to appeal to to them to start a recovery process either, because no. they're just being kicked around. And uh, on our own is to stop stop being a peer organization for a moment and sort of kick them away. And that <laughs> that's why I hate it. I wish I could take take my brother from here. Look. We're going to have to take a walk and go down to a recovery center. I mean, somewhere where that met, maybe medically they can treat them. Um, no. with, a, with a real physician, I don't know if there's any cure. I mean, I know addiction is there's no cure for addiction, but there is treatment. And just being a, being a peer-run organization that has on our own, there's, there's, we can provide so much information I have so much information to give, and I'm willing to give it to anyone. But you can't force people for it to, to help if they don't want help. If all they're going to do is go out there and get wasted every day, they're not going to ask for help, and that, I feel bad. I'd like to be able to take them off the street. But, you know, that's not going to happen. You can't just get, take, get a bus and just start handcuffing people who are wasted, throw them on the bus, bring them to somewhere up in the woods in West Virginia, put a gate around them, and force them to recover. Mm, yes, and if, if the government starts doing it, it would... It'd be scary. It would be, it would be like Holocaust, or just the, the well, exactly. it, it, indifference part will create a lot of yeah, there's, it, there's gotta be a, casualties. There's got to be something else. There's got to be something else. This place gives me a place and a purpose to help people. I've helped a few people, and then I've talked to this one young lady that was in here that I was, she was so young, you just looked at her and you're like, what are you doing homeless? And I talked to her for about a half hour about different things and different people she could talk to, and I wanted her to speak to a few specific people, and she gave me her phone number, and then I called her when the few people I wanted her to speak to were around, and I knew they were going to be around, and phone number is either a fake phone number or just turned off. It's like her service was turned off. That happens. So she's out there on the street. I don't know who this person that just came and gave me this name is. Um, I'm not going to say the name, but this person came and says, if you see my sister, and she's got tears in his eye, her eyes. I don't know if you noticed that. I noticed. Okay, and I look at that. Um, she's looking for her sister. She's, you could tell she's been crying the whole damn time, probably in her car on the way over here, on the way to the shelter which, where she was staying. I want to help this person. I want to find out who this is, find out where she is, and call your sister. And as she said, call your little sister. That's, yes. what, that's what I get out of here. That's what I get out of this place. I get a, a sense of purpose. It feels like I'm doing something with the, the life I lost. That's even before I was hired here. I sat at that desk and I had a purpose. I did. I was uh, answering phones and taking notes and taking messages and answering questions, many questions of people walking in. That's what we're for. That's what this place is for, is to help. That's what I like yes. doing. As little as I do, the little bit I can do, it, it 
makes a difference. And a little bit you do, and a little bit, and it's, it, once you take all these peers and become a group, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Everything takes time, but I'm working on that too. That's all I got. I'm I'm so frustrated with with my life in general. Um, I'd like to put the bag of medication on camera so let I people know. Of, uh, let yeah. people know. I thought of it, but I remembered the name that was. This is. That's okay. I don't mind. I had a heart attack. I have an enlarged left ventricle. Uh, my heart is in failure. My heart is technically in heart failure, which I thought means dead. But apparently it just means you're in heart failure. It means your heart doesn't work. It, very good anymore. And I take these medications for my heart to stay alive. Without the blood thinners and the, the anti-clotting medications and, and all this that I had to fight my insurance company for, by the way. They didn't just give them to me. Without them, I wouldn't be alive right now. And I'm very grateful to Medicaid for it. I'm working on another drug right now that I, my insurance does not cover. So I'm fighting them. I'm fighting to stay alive. That's what I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. It's got to be something else I could be doing to find a, a job, a house, S Social Security disability maybe that I've applied for and been denied six times even though I'm, I'm so freaking crippled and disabled. I don't, you know, you, you probably see me walking around here. You, you don't see me after 25 or more steps. You know, my legs don't work anymore. I sit at the desk every once in a while and I try to get up and it takes me it takes me five minutes to get the the courage and the energy to and the will to force my legs to push my body up and just deal with the pain because the pain is 24 seven. No sleep for me. I'm so walking around in a cloud, a haze of. I think that personally, that taking a nap here is in your in your situation is a very is a very wise idea. Perhaps, but I I don't. The the lack of sleep I already have. If I took a nap during the day, I wouldn't sleep all night. I wouldn't sleep one wink, and that is a that's a bleeping nightmare. I've done it many times. No sleep, none. You, Frickin' rolling around, and you just, all you could do is think. And what are you thinking about? Well, you're in a damn shelter with a hundred and seventeen people when the place is is raided for seventy people. You're crowded, and anything you do involves bumping into someone. It's horrible. It's just horrible, and I can't wait for it to be over. But I. I do because I don't feel like jumping in front of that bus just yet. I want, I want to see my brother's face before I die. That's what I want. Jump in front of the bus, uh, maybe. We'll it's easy. I could jump in front of the bus it anytime. Is easy. But what if it does? What What if you're reborn with the same amount of trauma and suffering? Yeah. Uh, uh, again, I'd yeah. have to live another 52 years yeah. of pain and misery. Or you'll recover. Or I'll recover. The depression is there all the time. It's just like the thought, the, the, the knowledge that you're homeless. It's not like you forget about it. It's, it's just a big fact that runs through all your synapses every single moment of every single day, of every single week, of every single month, of every in single year it's in my head and I'm like what the hell happened I still don't know what happened why didn't someone why didn't someone come forward and say Jim I want to help one of my friends that I had one of my I don't know just it's amazing that 
I called a buddy of mine, and he was scared that I might die on him, as he put it. I don't want you dying on me. Another Go somewhere else. Another liability subject. Yeah. Don't yeah, yeah. die here. Die somewhere oh, else. Oh, it's not like oh no, man. I recently gonna, had an, take care of you. I had an encounter at the YMC with the with the lifeguards. They had an evacuation. It's, it was also a little bit like. We want to evacuate you into the cold without letting you dress. Don't die. Don't, don't, don't. We don't want you to be affected by our emergency. But once you're out, it's not a problem. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think that's the fun, the, the, that's the problem. Excuse me, Vlad, for one moment. Fundamental cultural problem. Maybe, Cindy. Hello. 